you're not going to want to miss this episode of the AI Show where Mernoush talks all about model interpretability. It's pretty cool. Hello and welcome to this episode of the AI Show. I have a special guest with me, Mernoush. How are you, my friend? Great. How are you? Good. What do you do here at Microsoft? Um, I'm a technical program manager in Azure AI working on machine learning interpretability and fairness. So, you talk about fairness. Maybe you can explain this because there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy with AI around because nobody quite knows what it's doing. Can you explain what you mean by fairness in AI? Um, so, in general, Seth, AI is being used in a lot of different scenarios. We have really high stakes scenarios such as recidivism prediction where mm -hmm. AI decides whether someone should be released on bail and what is that individual's chance of recommitting a crime. We have scenarios in the healthcare that AI is basically deciding about someone's or predicting someone's chance of getting a particular type of disease, all the way to the finance world where AI decides if someone's portfolio carries a high risk for a loan application. Right. When we're tackling these very high stakes scenarios, we would like to make sure that our decisions or our AI decisions is being fair across the board and really is reliable, safe, private, and inclusive. So it's not just that. We want it to be fair, but there might be regulatory issues regarding yes. like, well, you can't discriminate when you lend, and if your AI is being a little discriminatory, that could be a Absolutely. problem as well. So yes. do we, what do we do at Microsoft to help explain how we do this stuff? So that's a very good question because uh, this is a global challenge that is happening right now. And in fact, in a very recent study from Capgemini Research Institute, it was highlighted that nine out of 10 um, executives in the world of AI is struggling to get AI right and is have they, they have reported that they have seen some form of challenge in the world of AI um, in the past two three years um, and basically what is happening is we as Microsoft have taken a step back and uh, we have come up with six different principles that ensures responsible development and deployment of artificial intelligence system and they are um, fairness inclusiveness, reliability and safety, privacy and security, underpinned by two foundational principles, transparency and accountability. This is a, this is a pretty good, good framework. And the one that, because I'm, I'm more of a data science kind of guy, and the one that's interesting to me is I, I understand all of the other ones, but it feels like the foundation of this is what is the model actually doing? So what do you mean by transparency? Um, so that's the focus of this AI show and uh, we focus on interpretability that while not a principle in its own is closely relevant to transparency and what it says is let's understand how the model has come up with its predictions. Basically you want to understand at the global level how the model is making prediction but also at the local level how the model's prediction is actually ma being made for a particular individual say why Nina has high risk of colon cancer. I see so it's not just a overall what's the model doing, no, but when you predict, why did it do what it did? Exactly, and it's important at two different stages. It's important at training time for model evaluators and model designers because they need tools to sell their models to non-technical stakeholders to build trust, but also they need this in order to debug their model and understand how their model has really come up with the predictions and improve the model. It is also important at inferencing time for the same reason. When you deploy the model, you want to make sure how the model is really behaving in the wild uh, and how its decision is really treating people. And that, that's interesting because, I mean, obviously these things when I went to school were a lot easier because they were all linear models, right? Yeah. And you knew that this feature mapped to this weight. And yes. if it's a bigger weight, then you knew that's what's affecting it. But with neural network models, it feels like it's a little bit harder to do that. Exactly, and that's why when we talk about interpretability, we usually mean two different classes of interpretability solutions. The first class is the interpretable models or intrinsically interpretable models like linear regression sure. that you mentioned, decision trees, those are the models that are just interpretable in nature. Right. You can train them, you can understand how the features play a role. The challenge with them is they're usually not generalizable to all scenarios. They right. have their shortcomings because of the assumptions that they make. Now, we do have this second class of interpretability solutions that we call black box explainers. And the way that we uh, explain them is basically they can explain any model, no matter what your model needs, is underneath. It can be a neural network, it can be a SVM, it can be a random forest, it mm -hmm. can be either traditional classifiers or state-of-the-art neural network classifiers or regressors. And basically the way that they do the job is they use a bunch of approximations based on which method you're using to come up with how this model is making a prediction. And it's super useful because you have a lot more flexibility. You can use this very strong 
classifiers of regressor at the training time, and then you can use these uh, explainers to explain how that model has made its predictions. So I'm having a hard time visualizing this because, like to me, like when I look at like a, let's just say you're using a logistic regression, the weights are very clear and you can yeah. map it and you know, and then maybe you can even like give it something without even knowing, you know exactly what it's going to predict, yeah. right? Because of the weight. But when it comes to like, let's just say you're using a convolutional neural network to predict what's in an image, right? How, how does the black box one actually work? Are you just giving it data and then figuring out what it's doing? Uh, maybe yeah, um, there are multiple different techniques, uh, either from Microsoft Research or state-of-the-art third-party libraries that are out there. Each one is using a particular technique. Uh, for example, we do have SHAP that is based on the idea of game theory mm -hmm. and tries to do a bunch of mathematical calculations to understand how different features as as uh, well as players are sort of playing to come up with that prediction which is oh, end of that I game. See. We do have mimic explainers or global circuits where they try, we bring uh, some interpretable models to mimic that black box model. We do have Lime that also has the idea of surrogate models but at the local phase. So each one is using a particular technique and at Microsoft we want to bring them all under the same roof, provide them to you within y a one API and one set of data structures. So uh, that's pretty exciting. Let me get back to the, the one before. So it's basically when you, now I think I'm understanding, when it's a black box model, you're saying you have some mathematical ways of knowing how to vary the input to vary the output in the way that you want, exactly. and that will tell you the yeah. features in that. So that's amazing. And then the second thing that was super interesting is you said we have an API to help with that. I'd love to see some of that. Great, sure. Let's go through a demo. So the way that it works is we do have an interpretability SDK, which is under Azure Machine Learning cool. SDK. So this is an SDK in AML? Yes. Okay, it is cool. an SDK in AML, which, which is great news because it can be used in conjunction with Azure Machine Learning Services. You can even deploy these explainers and use them at inferencing time to explain why the model is making its predictions on the fly. And uh, you can as well use it completely locally. We have a bunch of explainers that we're integrating on for tabular data. We have SHAP, uh, global circuit, different global circuit models, feature permutation, which is based on what you said, perturb features and see, see how the accuracy of the model changes. Obviously, the bigger that change, the more important the feature. And we do have support for Lime, which is also based on our idea of global circuit, but it's at the local phase. Um, and the demo that I'm going to do today is completely locally without contacting any Azure services. And the way that it works is basically um, you go through your training phase the, the way you used to go. So first you just import our tabular explainer or any other explainer that we have. As I said, we have multiple options. Then you get your data set. Now this data set is about uh, IBM employee attrition, cool. which is a binary classification that decides whether someone would leave the company or would stay with the company. You get the data, you clean it up, maybe get rid of some of the columns. Uh, you, you split it into test and train the, the way that you so used to do it. standard stuff. Completely standard stuff. Right. You do the transformations on your numeric and categorical features, and then your pipeline for training becomes those transformations and then your classifier. We support any classifier from the world of, or, or regressor from the world of traditional machine learning all the way to uh, more advanced algorithms like, uh, or deep uh, neural net frameworks like PyTorch, Keras Pi, uh, with TensorFlow backend, and also TensorFlow models. As far as the explainer is concerned, it's just another function it's testing. Exactly. Cool. So you fit your model. So far, nothing about interpretability. That's where we come into the scenario. You can use the import that you did on top, uh, pass the model to it, pass the background data or the initialization set, and these are some uh, extra features uh, that you can add, uh, like the feature names, uh, the name of the classes rather than seeing class 0 and 1. And if you pass the transformations, our SDK is able to reverse the transformation and provide to you, to you the explanation in terms of raw features rather oh, than engineered features, cool. which is exciting, uh, otherwise it defeats the purpose of really understanding what's happening. This little call explains, uh, creates an explainer object where that you can use to call explain global and explain local. So when you explain global, it means that globally, what are the important factors for that machine learning model? And uh, you can print them, look at them. For example, it says over time, number of companies per person previously have worked are the top two important features. Or you can see it across different classes. We here we have class staying and leaving. You can see what are the top key important features across these two class. You can also pass a particular data point to the explain local function. For example, you want to explain 
between me or someone else right. who works at that company, uh, and a range of data points. And you can uh, similarly see what are the top key important factors for that particular person. And this is really interesting, right? Because there may be a scenario where let's just say your model is not very kind yeah. to a certain class of people, which would make it effectively racist, which is not good. Yeah. You might have a scenario where the model passes on the global, yeah. but then as it gets examples that it hasn't seen, yeah. perhaps at inference time, it's starting. you're starting to recognize Absolutely. That there's a huge data drift that just happened from our m training to our inference, and now we need to fix that. Absolutely, and I want, to, uh, I want you to note that we also obviously have the model accuracy metrics, and they're super useful uh, to understand how the model is making its prediction. But the challenge is, I always, the famous example that pops into my head is um, a neural network that wanted to differentiate between the images of wolves versus huskies. Mm -hmm. The way that it used to do it was basically looking at the background. If it was snow, it was saying wolf. If it was grass, it was saying husky. Now. Obviously, we do have a problematic pattern that the uh, AI has learned, and it can't be generalized to other models. But the challenge was the accuracy was really good because the test set also happened to have uh, wolves with right. the background of snow and huskies with the background of grass. So we could completely lose this very problematic challenge uh, or pattern when we were looking at the accuracy, but transparency can come to help you to understand, okay, is the model really making predictions based on the mm, factors that make sense, or is just some random patterns that it has learned? That's cool. That's really cool. So um, we have added a visualization dashboard uh, that will allow you to understand um, this explanations and also in general your model better. Uh, right off the bat, when you run this visualization, you see four different tabs that are supposed to help you understand some global insights about your model. The first tab is data exploration that will help you to pick any feature on the x-axis, any feature on the y-axis. And for example, in this case, we have the predictions on the color wheel. The blue points have been predicted to stay. The uh, orange points have been predicted to leave the company. That's now, cool. the next tab is where the explanations comes into scenario. We have global importance, which shows what are the top key important features. So basically the information you saw from the function calls but now visualize. And you can play with how many of them you would like to see. This says over time a number of companies and job satisfaction are the top three factors that um, sort of contribute to someone would leave or stay with the company. And let, now, me, run, let me run this by yeah. you because I, I mean this is so such good. So if I'm seeing like in this bar chart right here, I'm seeing one bar that's super big and all the ones are super tiny you might be leaking the answer in one of your features, basically, and that would be one way of looking at these things. Exactly. Would that be a good way of thinking about it? Yeah, so basically, first of all, you can check it with some non-technical stakeholders and see whether this Got pattern it. makes sense. You can also see, okay, like, for example, are these patterns fair or not. So mm -hmm. for example, if in some scenarios of loan application, if gender or ethnicity is one of your top key important features or some factors that are heavily uh, correlated with gender and ethnicity, then you know that you have an issue and you need to go back to some fairness uh, frameworks and try to mitigate that. But the challenge with this chart is this is unsigned. So you can see in what direction, for example, over time helping. Um, so that's why we have added summary importance, which basically has signed local feature importance values across all data points points to show the distribution of impact that each feature has on prediction value. Uh, as you can see, we have the same uh, setup of features. The uh, high values of each feature is shown with red. The low values are shown in blue. So for example, in this case, you can see that the high values of over time is contributing negatively toward the prediction of staying, which is intuitive. Like if you oh, really, if the person is really working over time, then they probably are going to be predicted to uh, leave the company. Or high values of job satisfaction is contributed positively to the uh, prediction of staying. So if you're happy with your job, the model says that, okay, most probably you're going to stay with the company based on the training data it has received. So let me see if I understand this chart. So basically, red means high values, yep. and negative means impacting negatively for the, for the class. Yes. For the class. Correct. And then blue means low values. Yep. Okay. Okay. So if I'm reading this right, that means that high values of the overtime impact negatively on people staying. Exactly. Which makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and we also have this explanation exploration um, that let's disregard, that let's ignore the color for a, for a second. Demonstrates how a feature is responsible for making a change in model prediction values. So 
let's just focus on our first uh, observation. Ignore the color. We would like to see how the effect of number of companies worked on the probability of staying with the company changes with different values of number of companies worked. So on the y-axis, we have the feature values for number of companies worked. On the x-axis, we have the importance of um, the factor number of companies worked on, on the class staying. And as you can see, as people worked on more companies, so we're working towards the higher points of this uh, number of companies work feature, the feature values becomes negative toward the class staying. So that's sort of reinforcing the uh, insight that we saw in summary importance of how these different values of this feature is contributing to the prediction of staying versus um, leaving. Now, let's bring the color into the scenario. The color is job satisfaction, red values are high job satisfaction, and uh, blue values are low job satisfaction. So as you can see, let's focus on the last row, uh, which, is, uh, which are people who have switched the most number of companies in this data set nine. As you can see, the red points, for them, the feature importance value is closer to the magnitude zero, and for blue or purple, uh, the feature importance magnitude is further from zero. So now what this is saying, it says that number of companies has less impact on the probability of staying for people with higher job satisfaction and more impact on probability of staying for people with lower or just mediocre job satisfaction. So you can sort of see how these two features interact in a way. And this is really cool because, I mean, is this visualization available for all the models? Yes. This is pretty cool. Because I, one of the problems that I have is, and I, I hate this, and I hate this if you do this, mm -hmm. FYI. I remember going to a pretty smart place and they were showing me this neural network and they're like, we don't even know what it's doing on the inside. Yeah. And to me, that's super frustrating. Yeah. Like it's almost like you, you had something like make a function out yeah. of random whole cloth and you're yeah. okay with what it's doing. That's a problem, right? I totally hear you. And the great thing about this is basically you can pass any, as I said, PyTorch, a uh, model trained with PyTorch, TensorFlow, and Keras with TensorFlow backend. As long as your model has dot .predict, dot .predict proba functions um, implemented that is conforming to scikit convention, or you can pass another function that the output is conforming to scikit convention of uh, predict or predict proba, we can support that and we can explain that for you. So pretty much anything, Yes. and if it's completely random, you just make another function that takes your anything and makes it look like Correct. scikit learning in a work. Exactly. And the cool part about this is now I just gave you some uh, visuals about basically overall how the model is predicting. Um, you can click on any particular data point and that populates another window with local explanations. So basically I clicked on this person. This person was an orange point, so yes, the prediction was leaving. Here you can see a confirmation of that. That person has been predicted to leave the company with probability 81%. Now you can see what are the top K important factors factors that contributes to that particular prediction. You can play with them, for example, for this person, the fact that he or she was working over time, the fact that he or she has changed seven different companies in the past or uh, belongs to the sales department are the top three important factors that uh, uh, contribute to the prediction of leaving with 81%. Um, another tab that we have, you can see that individual's uh, data points here. Um, she has, for example, this travel situation of travels rarely, 20, she's 26 years old, she belongs to department sales, and you can run different what-if analysis scenarios here. For example, she travels rarely. What if um, she travels frequently? Well, the prediction is going to be leaving again, but now with 91%, Higher, yeah. right? So you can play a bunch of these games with this perturbation exploration scenario, and that's a very, very good uh, proxy into the world of fairness as well, because for example, say this is a loan application scenario, you can literally change the gender of the person from female or male to other or different values of gender and see how the prediction would change. Technically, in an ideal world, it shouldn't change because yes. the other factors that are really important for maybe someone's um, financial status sure. or things like that. Right. And eventually, we have this ice plot. Let me put it on a continuous factor. This ice plot is basically individual conditional expectation plot that is talking about let's keep all of his or her features the same. Just change one feature from a minimum value to a maximum value and see how the prediction would change. For instance, in this scenario, I change just his or her number of companies uh, that the person has previously worked at from a minimum value of zero to nine, which is apparently the maximum value in this data set. And as you can see, 
the value or the prediction probability of leaving is increasing as we move from a minimum value a number of companies to a maximum. Um, and obviously, this is symmetrical to uh, a decrease in chance of staying because this is a binary classification. But if it's, for example, multi-class classification, you can see some beautiful oh, patterns of cool. uh, how changing one feature from a minimum to maximum value would change the prediction. And see, not only, like, for example, when we change male to female, that, that was obviously insightful, but what yeah. if you have multiple like a linear kind of uh, change, you're exactly. able to see that vary over exactly. other features, which is really cool. Correct. Well, this is pretty amazing. Where can people go to find out more about this? Well, uh, we do have a documentation on Azure Machine Learning. Uh, simply if you search for Azure Machine Learning Interpretability, ours is the very first one that pops up. It work, works you through basically a bunch of visualizations. Um, uh, everything that I explained is sort of written there. You can learn about interpretability at scoring time and inferencing time as well as training time and we do have a link to the github of aml that basically walks you through a bunch of different examples either in conjunction with azure services or completely locally on your computer so again go to azure machine learning interpretability you got to find that maybe we'll even make a we'll make a link and we'll put it below so yes. you can go there this has been super insightful thanks so much thank you for having me thanks so much for watching we've been learning all about model interpretability Manoush, thanks so much thanks sure. so much for watching and we'll see you next time take care thanks Thank you.